The Oilers' first draft pick in 1978 was future Hall of Famer Earl Campbell. He rushed for over 1,400 yards as a rookie and was named the NFL's most valuable player. The summer of 78 found the Houston Oilers in San Angelo, Texas. Out on the practice fields of Angelo State University, a playoff contender was taking shape under the direction of the man in the tower, head coach Bum Phillips. Come on, come back to the ball. Come on, we got to converge on it. Bum had special interest in the progress of his top draft choice, number 34, Earl Campbell. Like any rookie runner, Campbell needed time to develop coordination with his offensive line. But Earl was willing to learn from backfield coach Andy Bourgeois. Heisman Trophy fame had not blinded this young man from Tyler, Texas, to the value of hard work and team play. Well, I'm going to spend some time learning, you know, but I hope I play a lot of football. And I think I fit into the system here all right. Yeah, because, you know, if you're playing on winning, I think you got to do it off the field, too. To build this winning attitude off the field, the Oilers got together after practice for country music, card games, and congeniality. Here, friendships were formed between coaches and players, veterans and rookies, that would make the tough road ahead travel easier. Some of the most valuable lessons learned in San Angelo went deeper than simple X's and O's. As summer slipped towards fall, a team of destiny emerged. The 1978 Houston Oilers were on track for the playoffs. As they rolled along picking up speed, they would thrill their home city, turn on Texas, and then capture the imagination of America. This was an express train known as the Oiler Cannonball. The season opened in Atlanta, and the Tyler Rose was ready the third time he touched the ball. Pass ready, retreats to throw, quick off to Campbell, has a blocker in front, at the 30, 35, 40, 45, he's open. 50, 45, 40, 35, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, Earl Campbell, Oilers lead it 6 to nothing. Campbell's motion was seconded by a rough-and-tumble Oilers defense that measured the Falcons for a whipping. But the NFL facts of life are sometimes harsh. One minute you're riding high, then the next, someone delivers the down and dirty blues. Week one proved that Houston still had a few things to learn about winning, as Atlanta took advantage of Euler errors for a 2014 victory. Center Carl Mock dies a little with every defeat. And he traveled to Kansas City on the season's second week, knowing that his team already faced a must-win situation. Offensive line coach Joe Bugle delivered the message loud and clear. Sustain. Sustain. If you get tired, I'll take you out. But sell the ranch, no pacing. No pacing. Let's do or die. You know that. Let's get after it real quick. All right, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Everybody up. Come on. Come on, now. we gotta take it down there and score. Let's go. Let's go. I right, I right. Check with me. Ready? Break. Put the stunt here, George. Oh, hey! Switch, switch! For the second straight week, the Oilers were working hard, but going nowhere fast. Come on, 
Let's go now! Using a quick-hitting wing tee, the Chiefs outflanked Houston and raced to a 14-0 lead. Frustration had been steadily building, and Mad Dog Mock was ready to blow. Oh, damn it, let's go here! Come on, we've got to have it now! Come on! Come on, come on, come on, come on! Don't run sideways, get it up in there. Suddenly, the running game meshed. Mock, Sampson, Reiner, Heyman, and Towns leading Campbell, Carpenter, and Wilson down the field and back into the chase. Go, baby, go! Houston closed to within three. The defense held, and with time running out, the infantry went out for one final assault. 65 yards on nine straight runs. He scored! He scored! He got it! He scored! The 2017 win was important because of the way the Oilers earned it. One thing, we took it away from them. We took it right away from them. We stuffed it right down their gut. We had to. The cannonball was on its way with 14 free agents on board. John Dearden turned in his cement truck for a spot on the bomb squad. Guido Merkins left a Sandlot softball team to pitch in. The macho men of the special teams came from all over to do the dirty work. J.C. Wilson, Kurt Knopf, Ted Thompson, Ken Kennard, and Ronnie Coleman all left their mark. Then, a noted Austrian professor of place kicking finished things off. Tony Fritsch pulled Houston through some tight spots in the early going as pressure field goals clinched narrow wins over San Francisco, Cleveland, and Buffalo. But even Professor Fritsch would have been helpless without the big blue D. During the first half of 78, Houston lived by its defense, and ageless Elvin Bethay led the way. The 11-year veteran had survived the order down years with all pro skills intact. Now he is surrounded by talent in a defense that won't be bulldogged. Up front are the power people, Bethay, Andy Doris, James Young, and Curly Culp. Linebacking is handled by the firm of Brazil, Bingham, Kiner, and Washington. The secondary is patrolled by Bill Currier, Greg Stemrick, Mike Reinfeld, and number 19, Willie Alexander. They are all, in a word, active. You may see a linebacker covering the bomb, a safety rushing the passer, or a lineman pursuing downfield. Eleven active men exchanging roles and helping each other out. You never know where they'll come from next. eighth week, on the road against the undefeated Pittsburgh Steelers, the Oiler defense had its finest moment. Trailing by seven points, Pittsburgh spent the final three minutes shooting for the end zone. Ten times the Steelers ran plays from inside the Houston 20. Ten times the Oiler defense turned them back. It was Houston's first win ever in Three River Stadium, and the Express was right on schedule. In the season's second half, the grade got steeper. On an overcast Sunday in Foxborough, Massachusetts, New England's high-powered Patriots scored the first five times they had the ball to take a 23-0 lead. But ever since San Angelo, Houston's confidence in its ability to move the ball against any defense had been growing. Two long drives, ending with Rob Carpenter touchdowns, set in motion one of the most incredible turnarounds in NFL history. In the second half, Houston ran 49 plays to the Patriots' 17, outgaining New England 224 yards to 43. Quarterback Dan Pastorini controlled the ball for 
of the final 30 minutes. That's the ready. Straight drop to throw. Dumps it in the end zone. He's there. Caster, touchdown. Oilers lead it. 26 to 23. The comeback stunned New England, but didn't surprise Bob and his quarterback. That's a hell of a character searcher there, right, boy. Right. Hadn't made a man reach and get it. The prime of Dante Pastorini has arrived. With an even blend of raw talent, acquired poise, and consistent protection. Pastorini was sacked fewer times than any other quarterback in the NFL, and he responded with the best season of his nine-year career. His receivers lent their hands. Rookie Mike Renfro. Former New York Jet Rich Caster. And old reliable Kenny Burrow. When injuries thinned out the receiving ranks, Houston called in yet another quality free agent. Tiny Woods had world-class speed and a proper magnetism for the ball. Houston's robust running game also improved Pastorini's passing attack. Play action opened up new areas to explore. And for the first time in years, Euler tight ends joined the aerial games. Mike Barber enthusiastically laid claim to the starter's role. And as Euler ground power attracted more and more attention, it was Barber who slipped into the wide open spaces. Houston was winning with style, and Astrodome apathy was a thing of the past. In 1978, home crowds were SRO, and the excitement reached a fever pitch on a Monday night against the Miami Dolphins. In a spontaneous display of affection, over 50,000 pom-poms beat out a rhythm of solidarity between town and team. This was a night that those who were there will never forget. Many tired arms were ready to drop off, but Earl Campbell still had something left. Enchanting and waving those Columbia blue pom-poms. Pitch back goes to Earl Campbell. Breaks a tackle at the 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. At the 50, he may go. At the 30, at the 20, at the 10, at the 5, touchdown! Houston defeated Miami 35-30, as Earl Campbell gained 199 yards rushing, adding another indelible chapter to the greatest rookie season in NFL history. It was no accident. From beginning to end, this native son never stopped trying to improve, working to coordinate his skills with those of his teammates. It was a marriage made in heaven. Houston, Texas, and the Tyler Rhodes. thundered on toward the playoffs.
In the season's 15th week, Houston traveled to New Orleans with a chance to clinch a wild card berth. Order win here, and they clinch a spot in the playoffs. Straight pro set. Pass to Rennie, back to throw. Looking far side of the field. It has Woods out there at the 30. Now breaks it out. 35, 40 at the 50. He may go. Ooh. Far sideline. He'll score. At the 20. At the 10. Touchdown. Houston orders Robert Wood from 80 yards away. All pros and free agents pull together. And for the first time in eight years, Houston entered the championship round. The playoffs began in Miami with some ominous signs. A long, hard season had taken its toll on the bodies, and friendly blue pom-poms had been replaced by dolphin white Yankees. The Oilers drew strength from each other. They padded their injured parts and tuned out the enemy crowd. Team, team, team. They all knew what needed to be done. Have a go, have a go, have a go now. Every man get a man, every good man get two. The struggle swayed back and forth, each side waiting for initial advantage. Fumbled punt gave Miami the edge, and the Dolphins broke on top, 7-0. Houston knew the feeling well. In six of their first seven wins, the Oilers had trailed at the half. So confident Dan Pastorini orchestrated a drive that tied the score at seven. Then, as evening enveloped the Orange Bowl, Pastorini became a wizard, using a cast of imps and goblins to guide his passes. Mike Barber's ingenuity set the stage, and Bum knew just what was needed to put the game away. We need about a three-minute drive and a touchdown, four-minute drive and a touchdown. I got one thing I want to say now. Everybody in this room deserves a game ball, but don't believe anybody deserves one more than number seven. Yeah. Time for celebration was short. In seven days, they would face another hostile crowd. New England Patriot fans called for revenge, but the Oilers were rolling too fast to stop now. All right, same song, second verse. Hello, yeah. Every man get a man ever good. Yeah. New England began the game with an all-out blitz. Play action, blitz is on, gonna have to hurry, he's gonna eat the football way back at the 37-yard line. That is twice in the ball game that Pastorini has been caught under the blitz. Pastorini took some heavy hits, but he bided his time, carefully setting a trap for the reckless Patriots. He got nine men within three yards of the line of scrimmage. Here they come. Dan delivers the pass, and he's going for Burrow, and it is caught at the 40-yard line. Kenny stays in bounds, and he's going to score. Oh, ho great play by Kenny Burrow to stay in bounds. Great job by Dan Pastorini reading the blitz. Burrow's touchdown opened the gates, and Houston powered its way to a 31-14 upset. Sun set on New England, an unspoken goal loomed on the horizon for the Oilers. They were only one win away from a spot in Super Bowl 13. Now listen to the blocking, the rambling, and the roar as he glides along the sidelines by the hash marks, then the score from the fancy passing day go to the Tyler Bowling Ball. Those poet patriots can be taken by the Oiler Cannonball. Hey, 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 hey. How long is it going to take you to memorize?
for the AFC Championship the next week in Pittsburgh, soggy yellow towels told the sad story. Under impossible conditions, the Steelers proved themselves better able to cope, and they traveled on to a world championship. The Oilers shuddered with the thought of how close they had come and the derailing of a dream. They say the harder we played, the behinder we got. I'm sure I'll look back on the season with a lot better frame of mind than I am right now. In the locker room, utter despair. But 2,000 miles away, a party was brewing in the Astrodome. KILT Radio had invited Oiler fans to welcome their team home. And despite the loss, they had showed up over 50,000 strong to show their love. Houston, Texas deserves it. And next year, we're going to give it our best and we're going to win it all for you. It's hard to put into words exactly what you feel right now. There's not anybody in the world more proud of Houston and the Houston fans and the Houston Oiler football team than I am. It's hard to come home a loser, but I'm going to tell you what, the Houston Oilers aren't losers, and they don't intend to lose again.